Groovy. Time to kick some butt. <laughs> That's entertainment. I'll drink to that. I'm gonna be honest. When I put up that poll last month to decide what game I'd cover after Alundra, I did not expect Heavy Metal Fact 2 to run away with it. You won't hear me complaining about it, though. Obscure retro games are what give me life, and apparently the same is true for my viewers. No worries for those who voted for Tomb Raider Remastered or Beyond Oasis, though. Those are still in the works, too. Now, without any further ado, let's crank some Heavy Metal. First published in 1977 by the same company responsible for National Lampoon, the magazine Heavy Metal began life as an American version of the French comic book Metal Hurlant until 1987 when Hurlant folded, turning Heavy Metal into its own brand. Heavy Metal's European roots meant that many of its stories pushed the boundaries of what American readers were accustomed to, particularly when it came to the comics. Owing to its magazine format keeping it away from the oppressive moralism of the Comics Code Authority, Heavy Metal was awash in comics with copious amounts of sex and violence that, at times, bordered on the pornographic, tawdry, salacious, and ever so often thought-provoking. There was nothing quite like Heavy Metal for American audiences in the 70s and 80s. This success would lead to the 1981 animated film most of you likely associated with the name Heavy Metal. It's... okay, I guess. The animation is fantastic in spots, and the music is... Well, it's as metal as you could ask a soundtrack in 1981 to be. Nobody knows the band Grand Funk? The wild shirtless lyrics of Mark Farner? The bong rattling bass of Mel Shocker? The competent drum work of Don Brewer? Oh, man! However, stapling several unrelated heavy metal stories into a 90-minute anthology film leaves none of the shorts with any time to breathe. Still, I can't deny the film's cult status and influence it left on animation. Netflix's Love, Death, and Robots, a series I absolutely adore, likely wouldn't even exist had it not been for David Fincher and Tim Miller's repeated failed attempts to reboot the original heavy metal film. Despite the moderate success they'd seen with the movie, Heavy Metal the magazine would begin lagging in sales by the start of the 90s and was eventually purchased by Kevin Eastman, the co-creator of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes, really. It was under Eastman's ownership that a straight-to-video sequel to the 81 film would see the light of day, Heavy Metal 2000. Rather than the anthology format of the original featuring work from multiple animation studios, Heavy Metal 2000 follows a singular story with Canada's Cine Group responsible for the animation. Ironically, the movie isn't an adaptation of anything printed in Heavy Metal. Instead, it's an adaptation of Eastman's Heavy Metal-inspired graphic novel, The Melting Pot. Starring 90s B-movie mainstay Julie Strain, who totally wasn't cast because she was Kevin Eastman's wife whose likeness adorned a big chunk of heavy metal covers throughout their marriage, I don't know what would make you think that. Heavy Metal 2000 concerns space warrior woman Julie, yes, that is her name in the film, too, and her quest to save her sister from the clutches of the psychotic would-be galactic overlord, Tyler. Being played by Michael Ironside does help make up for his hilariously plain name, though. You. Fat boy. Name and duties. Critically, Heavy Metal 2000 was savaged, sporting a paltry 8% critic score and a 36% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. So of course I enjoyed this one much more. Hey! Who's gonna pay for all this? This ought to take care of it. Here, keep the change. What? Holy shit! It's still not a good movie, and being from the year 2000, there are plenty of moments of comically awful dated CG, not to mention a soundtrack that's just as dated as the first movies with the likes of Cold Chamber, Apartment 26, and the fucking insane clown posse providing songs. Sammy the Gerbil and his Muffin Adventure! Yet thanks to its better pacing, likely owed in no small part to being one narrative, and the fun performances of the likes of Michael Ironside and Billy Idol, I found Heavy Metal 2000 to be a fun late-night popcorn flick, if nothing else. Plus, it's thanks to this movie that we have today's game. Coming to us from the fine folks at Ritual Entertainment, developers of two previous titles I've covered, Sin and Star Trek Elite Force 2, Heavy Metal Fact 2 is a computer-exclusive sequel to the events of Heavy Metal 2000. 
Released in August of 2000 for Windows, October for Mac OS, and even getting a Linux port a year later, Fact 2 is a third-person action-adventure game in the vein of Raven Software's Heretic 2. Translated to console player, it's what happens when you take the third-person action that was all the rage at the time and slap that formula onto the id tech engine. In Fact 2's case, that would be id tech 3, the same engine that powered Quake 3 Arena as well as both Elite Force titles. It does bear mentioning, however, that Fact 2 didn't look quite this sharp on release. That would be thanks to a widescreen patch and an HD texture pack, both of which I'll be linking in the description. Set some 30 years after the events of Heavy Metal 2000, Fact 2 takes its name from the designation of Julie's home planet, Eden. Federation assigned ketogenic kill zone to the second level. Yeah. Typically, Fact 2 is assigned to the sort of planet that kills organic life in seconds. So, you know, Space Florida. Eden, meanwhile, is a paradise home to waters which grant immortality that employs a false Fact 2 designation to hide itself from the galaxy at large. Though I have to question how well this strategy works when both stories featuring this planet involve it being invaded by the Big Bad and his army. <laughs> this time around, Eden is attacked by the nefarious Gith. Resist the urge to make D&D jokes? An intergalactic conqueror who has enslaved countless worlds and now aims to steal the mysterious Heart of the Wii hidden somewhere on Eden. It's up to Julie to beat Gith's forces to the heart and save the day once again. And that's about all the plot you'll be getting for Fact 2. The cutscenes sprinkled between the point you leave Julie's hometown up until the final boss fight have no real plot relevance aside from explaining how Julie gets from point A to point B. Geronimo! Most of the non-movie characters are introduced and then dropped from the story so quickly that you barely have time to remember their names, much less their personalities. Except for Rasta Yoda here. Hello there, pretty thing! Ah, I see you're finally waking up! I don't know if this is offensive or just plain stupid, but dear lord can you tell that someone thought this guy was hilarious. Every other story bit breezes by and then right before the final area, Fact 2 stops dead in its tracks for shtick. Ha! Otto! Ha! The heart! Ha! Whoa ho ho ho! Baby, that's a lot for a first date! Luckily for everyone not making a YouTube video on this game, you can skip this cutscene and the most you'll miss is Julie stealing his minigun before getting teleported to the definitely final dungeon. Teleportation, which apparently came equipped with a wardrobe change. So you're saying this game was made by the same studio responsible for Sin? I'm not seeing the resemblance. Joking aside, I can't imagine a more perfect choice to make a heavy metal game at this point in time than Ritual Entertainment. A profound infusion of horniness was practically Ritual's trademark. Some obstacles may require you to bring your legs up. Press the jump key to wrap your legs around the pipe, allowing for better fits into small areas. So, we're just done with phrasing, right? That's not a thing anymore? And, well, the magazine was hardly ever above putting fan service front and center, even before Eastman started putting his wife on every cover. It may never reach the point of showing any full-on nudity in Fact 2, save for the nightmare-inducing monster titties, but they do their best to make up for it by putting Julie in plenty of revealing outfits. Makeover! Makeover, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. For you and me. Whoever was in charge of Alexis Sinclair's rotating wardrobe in Sin had to be over the damn moon with Fact 2. These outfits are so over the top that they fly clear past provocative all the way into comical. Except for this number. It's still fan service as all hell, but the Power Girl boob window, painted on purple snakeskin pants, coupled with the hunter stripe camo paint, pulled together into something kinda badass. And then it gets traded out for a black bikini. I mean, come on! You didn't even try! You just took all the extra parts off of the outfit she has on the cover, painted everything that remained black, and then added futuristic sunglasses. Aesthetics still matter even when you're trying to turn the audience on. If you're going to be pervy, then don't half-ass it, damn it! <clears throat> now that Fashionista Swanee has had his say, that profound infusion of horniness I mentioned earlier is even stronger here than in Sin. In fact, if you'll pardon the impending pun, it penetrated all the way to the environmental design. There's a point when a rock formation goes spread eagle on you, that all you can do is laugh at the sheer audacity of it. In my video on Sin, I talked about how I found its juvenile attempts at maturity to be quaint and kind of charming. Like an immature kid desperately trying to be seen as a mature adult. And the same is true here. 
Your mileage may vary, obviously, but I've played the kind of sleazeball games that make me feel like I need a shower afterwards, and Fact 2 is far from that. For starters, Ritual still put in the effort to make this a fun game despite doing all the programming with one hand. Fact 2 comes from an interesting era of PC gaming when the trends of console games were beginning to affect design decisions in the PC space. Speaking as a kid who was just really getting big into video games at the time, there seemed to be a growing push to consoleize PC games, likely out of a desire from the publisher to have the game ready to go for a console port, or possibly because the developers wanted to prove that modern PCs could easily handle the types of games consoles could. Whatever the case, this often led to games that felt like the programming equivalent of driving a square peg into a round hole. <laughs> One of the most common examples was trying to use engines for genres they weren't designed for. Say, for instance, building a third-person action-adventure game in the same engine as Quake 3 Arena. Not the game I was talking about, but thanks for reminding me. As I said earlier, Fact 2 was built on id Tech 3. And yes, you can tell almost immediately that this was built on a classic FPS engine. There's a distinct kind of slipperiness to your movement in these old boom shoots. Though personally, it's never been near that, like moving around on skates description I often see critics use. Then again, I've played so many shooters in my life that I'm not exactly working from an objective point of view here. Is it bad when you play Congo The Lost City of Zinge and your reaction is, eh, I've played far worse, and then you keep playing for another hour? Where was I going with this? Right, boomer shooter movement. Regardless of my own tolerance for such things, there's no denying that you move much faster in these types of games, and that can feel even stranger in third person. This typically comes to a head with platforming. The titles that do handle it better go out of their way to compensate for that loose movement. To go back to American McGee's Alice for a second, Alice is given a higher jump closer to the likes of Mario, and the aiming reticle exists within the game world to better help the player judge distances. To my relief, Ritual was of a similar mind and accounted for this problem in their own way by including an extremely generous ledge grab. So long as you're within the ballpark of a ledge, Julie will most likely grab it instead of plummeting to her death. Unless you're trying to get on these stupid monkey bars. Mulligan. Mulligan. Finally! It can also be slightly annoying how you have to wait an extra second before being able to climb up. It really takes away a sense of flow to successful jumps. Fulfilling the violence quota of Heavy Metal's preferred blend of sex and violence, combat in Fact 2 comes at you as frequently as the platforming. In an interesting deviation to see from an FPS developer, shooting takes a back seat to melee combat, and I'm talking all the way in that pull-out third row of seats in the SUV kind of back seat. Oh sure, you get a sizable arsenal to play with, but nothing is quite as reliable as Julie's sword and its elemental variants. And the sword is fun to use, don't misunderstand me. It's just a shame to me for a game to offer the ability to mix and match what weapon I have equipped in each hand, only for the most reliable option throughout the game to be a sword and shield. The cumbersome way in which you switch between weapons doesn't help matters either. All your weapons and items are placed into categories which are bound to the number keys. To equip a weapon, you have to repeatedly tap the respective number until the one you want is selected, then click the left mouse button to equip it in the left hand, or the right mouse button for the right hand except for swords, which can only be equipped in the right, and shields, which can only be equipped in the left. This means that if you want to switch weapons mid-combat, you'll be juggling the weapon menu while avoiding enemies as best you can. In the time I waste swapping to a gun, they've already closed the gap and I can easily slice them to ribbons with my trusty fire sword. I'm not a programmer, so I have no clue how easy this would have been to implement, but I think allowing the player to set their own weapon combinations to swap between would have alleviated this issue. On the positive end, melee combat is simple, yet satisfying. Hold down the right mouse button and Julie will do a basic 1-2 combo swing. But if you switch over to the left mouse button near the end of the second swing, she'll perform a longer combo which changes depending on what she's holding in her left hand. Or in the case of the awesome but impractical two-handers like the axe and this chain sword straight out of 40k, holding down either mouse button is enough to execute the whole combo. Though it's obviously no Devil May Cry, the melee system does its job well. Hacking enemies to pieces with a charged-up elemental sword always left me feeling like an unstoppable badass. Speaking of that little charge-up, one of Fact 2's most intriguing features is the water meter. 
Okay, so when I say the term water meter out loud, it sounds ridiculous, but bear with me a sec. Incorporating how the waters of Eden are portrayed in Heavy Metal 2000 as empowering those who drink it, water is used in fact too as the replacement for armor. In addition to blunting damage taken, getting the meter close to max will increase Julie's movement speed and give her a longer jump. This does wind up being a bit of an underutilized mechanic, however, as it'd take a player far better than I to avoid damage for most of the game. It is extremely helpful at the start, though, to grab the Fire Sword. Have I mentioned how good the Fire Sword is yet? Make sure you grab it ASAP. Both the Fire Sword and its stronger electrical sibling are also empowered by the Water Meter. So long as you keep your water above a quarter full while wielding the Fire Sword, and I think about a third full for the Electrical Sword, They'll deal added elemental damage with every strike, seeing as how you can replenish your water up to half by standing in most bodies of water, and then boost it the rest of the way with the ampule strewn about the levels, it's not hard to keep it above that level. Which makes for yet another reason why you'll barely use guns unless an enemy is out of reach or it's the final area, and you're getting swarmed by these bullshit blue bugs bellowing blazing breath barbecuing bodacious babes. Alliteration is fun. Flying enemies are Fact 2's biggest pain in the ass. Well, besides the obvious wedgie Julie's got going on in that first outfit. <laughs> While these beetle-mosquito hybrid things are closer to an annoyance for most of the game, it's their fire-breathing blue cousins that pose a bigger problem. So if you see a blue bug heading towards you, you kill him dead. Doesn't matter what else you're dealing with, you murder death kill these bugs before they can so much as blink. Hey! Are you dead? You have to tell me if you're dead! That is murder, death, kill rules! The other irritating flying enemies are the dive-bombing birds and their suicide bomber variants. For reasons I don't quite understand, you can't consistently damage them until they're stuck in the ground, and even worse, the exploding versions can send you flying off into the abyss if you aren't paying attention. For obvious reasons, the explosive ones are among the few enemies where using ranged weapons is actually beneficial. The one thing that saves it from being blindingly infuriating is that they'll let out a cry right as they start to dive, giving you enough time to, hopefully, move far enough out of the way. Now we come to the level design, and okay, I've done everything I can to avoid using Tomb Raider as a direct comparison throughout this video, but I have to here. If there's one thing that I think everyone familiar with classic Tomb Raider can agree with me on, it's that Core's level design was, 9 times out of 10, absolutely stellar. You want examples of how to make levels that provide a sense of adventure as you explore ancient ruins and untamed wilderness? You have four great games, and chronicles, to use for reference. Fact 2 instead leans more into the typical action game design philosophy of the time to create levels that are superficially open, but in reality are linear as can be. This wouldn't necessarily be a problem if, hysterically Freudian imagery aside, the visual design wasn't so well done that it made me want to be able to explore around more. Fact 2 doesn't even have secrets to discover, or at least it doesn't do anything to push the player to go out of their way to find hidden paths. Most of the time, the quote-unquote hidden supplies were on a ledge slightly above or below where I needed to go anyways. That's not a secret, that's basic level design. This sucks because Julie's hometown, which I always forget the name of, sets you up for more. Like with getting the Fire Sword. You have to cut a rope to raise this platform, then clamber all the way up here before taking a full water meter running jump to just barely make it over to the alcove containing the crystal that unlocks the Fire Sword. This is one of the only times in the entire game that anything not essential for progress requires so much effort in order to reach. It makes me wonder if the game was rushed in order to come out close to the film. Wait. This was published by Gathering of Developers after they were acquired by Take-Two. Correction, I'm pretty damn sure that Fact 2 was rushed in order to come out close to the film. Which makes no sense when Heavy Metal 2000 went straight to video. There'd be no wave of hype to ride for extra sales. And honestly, with a cover like this, can you honestly tell me that this movie wouldn't have been a popular rental for years? Give Fact 2 another year in the oven, or hell, just six months, and you'd probably have more than just weirdos like me talking about it these days. Well, whatever. Not much I can do about it. On to the visuals and sound, I guess. For as much as I like the general aesthetic Ritual went for here, something the texture pack I used only enhances, dear god are the faces in this game horrifying. 
They're right at that midpoint when developers were trying to include something approaching lip sync instead of simply bobbing the character's head around while they talked, but the higher resolution I played this at meant that all I could focus on was everyone's complete lack of teeth. And then you have examples like this little girl who I will be seeing in my nightmares for years to come. I never needed to know that the Uncanny Valley had its own Uncanny Valley. What an excellent day for an exorcism. Then there's the stuff that's just a consequence of playing the game at a higher resolution than intended. Like how Julie's eyeballs have a seam in the middle that bends inward since they're part of the flat face texture and not their own models. The rest of the game, including character models from the neck down, look perfectly acceptable for the time. I'm not going to act as if these old low-poly models are peak graphics or anything, even if they objectively are. But this was about what you would usually expect from graphics on PC in the year 2000. The fact that Elite Force 2 was made by the same developer and used the exact same engine should tell you how swiftly 3D graphics advanced after the turn of the millennium. It's part of what makes it hard for me to talk about the graphics of early 3D games. Oh sure, it's easy to point out the ones that looked awful even back then, but take Quake for example. How does a layman like me who wasn't even two years old when it came out properly convey the impressiveness of what John Carmack, Michael Abrash, and John Cash achieved here? I don't have the technical aptitude to explain the details, and I'm not confident that I wouldn't mangle a more knowledgeable person's explanation. Sometimes it feels as if I'm trapped in a hell of my own ignorance. Desperate to convey my love and appreciation for early 3D games and the trail they blazed, yet incapable of understanding the minutiae enough to help newcomers grasp the importance. Because that's the point of sharing our love of old games, right? We want others to play the games we adore so that they're not forgotten. At least that's why I make my videos. It makes my day every time I get a comment telling me that they're going to check out a game because of a video I did. Gaming should be fun. It should be something we're eager to share with others. People should be looking for games to enjoy rather than constantly feeding the same, tiring outrage cycle over and over again. If I can put even the tiniest of dents in that trend of hateful assholes co-opting my hobby so that they can make everyone else as miserable as they are, then I can call this channel a success. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Fact 2's sound design is pretty good overall. Following on from Sin, I wouldn't expect any less. Melee weapons have the requisite swipes and swooshes, and guns have a solid punchiness. In fact, the hand cannon sound effect is almost too good for what amounts to the basic pistol. The way this thing sounds, I should be reducing enemies to a fine mist with a single shot. Okay, okay, I'll stop harping on the weakness of the guns already. On the voice acting end, it's pretty par for the course of the time. Oh, hey! Jermaine St. Germain, at your service. How's my girl Farron? Still eating up this year's crop? <laughs> hey yourself, shouldn't you be home looking after Carrie instead of playing with yourself? Not great, not bad, save for one comically bad line read I'll get to in a bit. I wouldn't even really note it if not for the fact that I noticed ADV films listed in the special thanks of the poorly formatted credits. Now for those unaware, ADV films were one of the main anime dub studios back then. What the hell do you want, Excel? Oh, I love you so fucking much. So it caught me by surprise to see them credited in a game, and a non-Japanese title at that. Then I remembered that both ADV and Ritual were based in Texas, plus the fact that ADV dubbed that crappy anime adaptation of Sin, Your sins will catch up with you, Blade. Yeah, yeah, there it is, there it is! And it all made sense. It does make me wonder, though, if any of their regulars worked on this under a pseudonym. The problem is that it's been so long since I've heard an ADV dub that I can only easily recognize Spike Spencer or Jessica Calvello these days. You have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? That awful formatting in the credits extends to the folks at Ritual who worked on this game, too. The only reason I'm sure that Zach Bellica did the music for this is because he was the one responsible for the music in every good Ritual game. In fact, it almost feels like a spiritual successor to Sin's soundtrack with its blend of electronic beats spiced with metal-tinged guitars.
but I kind of wish it had been closer to traditional heavy metal in style. Yes, I realize the irony in asking for that from a tie-in to a movie which, again, had a soundtrack filled to the brim with new metal and clown-based horrorcore. Yet I think a mix of classic heavy metal like Sabbath or Judas Priest crossed with touches of the doomy elements of Sirith Ungol, and maybe just a few early speed metal bits akin to Motorhead, would have better sold the heavy metal part of Heavy Metal Fact 2. That's just a personal quibble of mine. The actual quality of Zach Bellica's work is rock fucking solid as usual. Only got one quick spoiler bit before we wrap up this time. Skip ahead to hear for my conclusion if you don't want to have the final boss or the ending spoiled for you. The final boss is where everything starts to fall apart for me, and I have a feeling this is where they really had to crunch, because everything seems to happen at lightning speed. Julie finds the heart of the Wii, only for Gith to crash the party and reveal that he would have never been able to reach it without her help. Which is a twist I tend to hate unless it's been properly set up, because it feels like it makes the whole journey pointless when the hero could have won by doing nothing. So you saved Udragoth by boldly and heroically working on my tan. Pretty neat, huh? Things go from bad to worse when Julie just, uh, stands there as Gith marches his crimes against nature into the heart to corrupt it? Empower it? I've beaten this game twice and I still don't understand what happens here. Well anyways, this winds up either resurrecting Tyler from the grave, or causes Julie to have to fight a mental projection of him. Again, it's not clear. Gith says something about seeing into Julie's mind and knowing what she fears most, but with how the scene plays out, I'm not sure what exactly he has the heart do with that knowledge. I lean towards mental projection though, because the size difference wasn't this great in the movie. And alas, Tyler isn't voiced by Michael Ironside here. I have risen, and I come for you. You only killed me once. Get ready to join me in eternal damnation, bitch! Die! This is also where that one awful line read I was talking about comes in at. <laughs> I honestly think Julie Strain did a solid job the rest of the time, both here and in the movie. But holy shit is this bad. She sounds like a kid pouting that they don't have her favorite ice cream flavor, rather than someone who just saw the person they fear most come back to life. The fight itself sucks too. Not only does Tyler soak up a ton of damage, but minions will keep spawning in endlessly throughout the fight. And once you get his health down to set levels, he'll use a water ampule to heal himself if you don't quickly use the awful vacuum weapon you've likely forgotten you even have by this point, because it sucks and is never useful until now. Eventually, Tyler will drop his giant sword that, despite its size, And I see your Schwartz is as big as mine! can only hit him if you do a jumping attack. This goes for the other melee weapons, too. It's necessary to use it at the end, though, to kill Tyler once and for all again. With that, the heart of the Wii is somehow saved, Gith retreats, Retreat! and then Julie returns home to her hero's welcome, only to learn that Gith has kidnapped her sister. Cue credits! A cliffhanger ending to a game that never got a sequel and almost certainly never will. Please excuse me for a moment while I go suppress traumatic flashbacks to Bioforge. Coming from a talented developer, Heavy Metal Fact 2 is far better of a tie-in game than Heavy Metal 2000 deserve. While I may have enjoyed the film more than others, a video game sequel to a straight-to-video movie had no right to be this enjoyable. Good visual design in a setting Ritual was practically founded to work on, plus a fun combat loop and competent platforming in an engine not built for such a game, balance out the minimal story and overly linear level design. Offering up an underrated action-adventure title which surprisingly lacks much in the way of cult status. This feels like the exact kind of game begging for a digital rediscovery, yet for reasons likely to do with the Heavy Metal license, it never has. For now, prices on the disc in a jewel case aren't insane, but a GOG release would be more than welcome. As for the magazine itself, sadly Heavy Metal ceased publication last year in the middle of 2023. 
killed by a vulture, sorry, venture capitalist fanboy of the original movie, looking to turn the brand into an IP farm and source of NFTs. To the lack of surprise of anyone besides Matthew Medney himself, creatives tend to resent not retaining the rights to their own work published in what was supposed to be an anthology magazine designed to springboard writers and artists to greater heights. Trying to turn the magazine into an IP farm and also using it to shill NFTs, I cannot emphasize that part enough, would also obviously help drive away what loyal fans were left of a dwindling brand. Maybe re-establish the brand in the minds of people before deciding to open up a film branch to create a cinematic universe, eh Matt? Off topic, I also learned during my research that Grant Morrison was editor-in-chief for two years, and holy fucking ass crackers, I need to track down those issues ASAP. That's it for this game. Next time we'll be going just a bit more modern, and I hope you'll indulge me here. I'll see you then. Disaster! It's the end of the world! I'll say it is! Coco the trumpet playing chicken is missing!